At the heart of my work lies a sociological interest in the practice of masquerade and its role in relation to cultural conceptions of identity and power. I employ satire, humor, and familiar imagery to provoke an examination of the relationships that make our own societal bubbles and those we label foreign or unknown to our experiences. Um, in the show that I have right now are kind of the two main bodies of my work. The more overtly narrative paintings, like these two, and an ongoing piece entitled Conceal Project, which I've broken down into kind of three sets. Um, all are painted in gouache, watercolor, ink, and acrylic on colored Stonehenge paper, which happens to be called fawn, which is kind of funny. The figures in my work are selected from various sources, societies, and time periods. Um, I go all over the place looking for images, thrift stores, antique shops, searching for cabinet cards, encyclopedias, National Geographics. I browse Flickr, Facebook, do very random web searches, and search online public archives. I think of this limitless bank of images as a collective unconscious, a shared state. We are all contributing and part of it. I make intuitive selections and am particularly interested in visualizations of social practices that engender power hierarchies, the religious, ethnic, and sexual nuances of power. Who are the meek, the shameless, and when do those roles interchange? Societal practices of masquerade, uniform, religious dress, muddle conceptions of power and identity. It is provoking how a disguise, even a uniform, engenders the wearer powerful through his or her clandestine anonymity. Even more disturbing is the disguise's paradoxical virtue of allowing the concealed individual to be his or her authentic self, to commit atrocities, to dress the part. Which identity is authentic? the intrinsic self or the identity acquired through masquerade, or do they create a third identity through the blending of the two? One's cultural heritage will determine an initial gut reaction to an image. I find these kinds of associations and how they can differ fascinating. In this group of work, this particular image here um, is an example of that. And this is um, a suicide bomber from one of the many places that I find images on the website. She is an archetype of terror for most, but not all. I think of all the figures as archetypes, the mother, the soldier, the suicide bomber, the bride, the victim, the perpetrator. I compose narratives influenced by the ideas of James Hillman, Joseph Campbell, and myth-making in general. Campbell's monomyth is a myth that is found throughout the world, familiar to all, like the hero myth but with slight cultural regional nuances. I find these monomyths compelling because they can bring understanding to the viewers unfamiliar with other cultural norms. I'm not trying to illustrate any particular myth, but seek to provoke critical thought regarding current attitudes and conflicts within the terms of universal stories and cautionary tales. Um, there's a certain ambiguity in my work that I really like to think of um, as a space to spark intuition. Uh, this work actually is a little bit more um, overt, but the other work um, I think is a little bit more ambiguous. The space to allow access to what James Hillman calls the fundamental fantasies that animate all life. He believed that it is important to recognize the myriad fantasies and myths that shape and are shaped by our psychological lives. So this particular piece is pretty characteristic of the majority of my work. Um, the way I work is very dynamic, and you can see that here, uh, the watercolor, it's very fluid, but there are passages where I've controlled that water, and I think that um, that aspect of the tight versus the loose, of the flow versus the controlled, is a very big part formally of creating the work, but then also of um, the story within the work. Um, sometimes this always doesn't work. I have to start over. The piece gets destroyed because the flow was wrong, or I overwork it. So um, the nature of the watercolor of working on paper um, doesn't lend itself to mistakes. And I really enjoy that process. I don't mind starting over. It's just an aspect of of working that way. 
Uh, I'm also interested in the traditional Eastern approach of creating space rather than using um, linear perspective. Um, Persian miniature painting, Japanese prints and screens are inspirations. I use symbolic perspective, the size of the figure indicating their importance relative to other figures, scale multiple viewpoints to compose the work. So again, in this piece, um, I've decontextualized the figure so there is no background. So some visual clues to start to think about the work is how big is this figure? There's this element of um, not le well, levity or humor because there's a massive change of scale from one figure to the other um, that is not really talking about linear perspective in terms of creating the space. Um, many of my paintings examine violence, xenophobia, and the glamorization, personification of death this particular piece and then um, this piece on the end and then the other one in the other room. Um, the things that I think about when I'm making these works, why are just the basic things that we all kind of think about when we read the news? Why are people so violent? Why is this an endless, endless cycle? And why do we seem so proud of this? These pieces are meant to be confrontational and somewhat incendiary in hopes that they will ex incite an examination of these questions. So in this piece, the last thing to talk about it, um, the main women are kind of an idea of a, a scarecrow or a cheerleader, and they're creating um, this kind of cheerleading, uh, what do you call it, when they make a, um, I forget what you call it. Yeah, when they make a pyramid. <laughs> they make a pyramid, and um, there's this figure here that is kind of, um, screaming out signals or commands and out of his megaphone and it's it's humorous but then also there's a that underneath under belly layer of violence so we have these um, rebels or freedom fighters here we have a more traditional Western soldier and then we have this beautiful Swarovski crystal death Pope couture figure in the center who's kind of um, above everything else and it's all very comical uh, in, in that way. Um, the, fig the paintings right here, this tiny painting there and then the large um, bloody one in the other room, they're both called Extinctathon and this particular piece in here is called Extinctathon Antietam and it's where I've juxtaposed the Civil War battlefield in, an in Antietam with a thug mask and an American flag, questioning how conflict is historically memorable and powerful in relation to the power of national pride. Um, and the other piece, um, it's more, more uh, confrontational, clearly, because it's just a big bloody mess. Um, but there's a figure to the lower left that's kind of a quiet reflection um, on that massacre. So um, kind of almost in a way personifying death. She's a tribal woman that's got a skeleton drawn on her body, silently questioning the happening or the nature of humanity. Um, this piece here is called Folly's Garden. Um, this and this other piece, the little extinct the bomb, which is funny. Um, are not very characteristic of the majority of my work. I really enjoy creating and composing images um, with the background being empty. Um, I just love decontextualizing the figures so they become more accessible to people that um, may not be familiar with different cultures. And the background is, is, un is not necessary. I think of it as a stage and a place where people can um, <coughs> can concentrate on the figures themselves. Here is a personification of Folly, and it's entitled Folly's Garden. And so she's surrounded by you know, this beautiful, almost um, paradise. <coughs> and these are kind of these, um, her friends that are a little bit menacingly charming, perhaps. So um, you know, there's that element of, hopefully, of mystery of, again, that sense of ambiguity, perhaps, like what, what's going to happen um, if you walk through the woods there. So 
So the last thing I'm going to talk about or the last body of work is the Conceal Project and then I would love to answer any questions that y'all might have. Um, this group of work is a collection of postcard sized drawings of disguised concealed people from torture victims to prostitutes to brides. I think of these as a visual catalog of our archetypes. Seen in a large group, the relationship from one figure to another foments religious and cultural tolerance through the broad spectrum of various identities, in addition to provoking critical thought regarding stereotypes and hatred. Um, the installation of this work is a little bit different than what I usually do. I broke it up into kind of three um, segments. So on this wall to the left here is what I've done in the past. It's basically just um, an ag aggregation, a panoply of all the figures that I've been collecting. So far, I've been working on this project since 2008, and I've made about 300 pieces in the Conceal project. So if you saw my show here a few years ago, there was about a wall of, I don't remember how many, maybe 60 to 80 in that arrangement um, of just the, the largest spectrum I could find. So in this grouping, there's a 1950s butcher, there's the 2010 Miss Japan, there's a rebel from Nigeria, there's a neo-Nazi biker I think from the 60s, uh, there's Marie Colvin, the photojournalist who just died, uh, there's my grandma-in-law. And then the last grouping in here, again, kind of on a happy note, uh, is called Nuptial. And it's a group of, ex of exquisitely beautiful um, women about to be married. And the first figure is kind of this depraved fairy godfather. And he's kind of waving his wand. And then there's a figure out of the grid that um, is kind of heckling them, perhaps, or kind of maybe trying to get their attention. Um, so maybe making a statement about, you know, the, a group of women that are about to be married and no longer their own person, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I don't think that, but I think that it's interesting to, uh, it's interesting that people would dress in such a way and be so beautiful and to think of the history behind, behind a woman and, and being given to a man and it's just strange. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. The woman at the top, whose hands are all bloody, is she the causing it? Is she explaining it? What is she doing up there? I see it as she is lamenting, lamenting it, and she is in the. I mean, the original paint the, uh, figure was a woman. The body had been carting, carted away, and she was lamenting the fact that somebody either died or was more, you know, was wounded there. So she was just in the blood, like mm -hmm. very um, hysterically upset. So, and then I, you know, there's an element of uh, surrealism to my work, if you want to put put that label on it, or you know, um, not fantasy, but more surrealism, that it just accentuated the. It grew, the blood grew. I, I just wanted to comment. I, I see a lot of theatricality, I suppose we all do, and way, what you're doing and how you're presenting it, it's almost like uh, a marriage of theater because you're talking so much about social issues in the work in a dynamic kind of way, a fluid kind of way, which is what theater is. And it's scenic. I mean, there are different views, which is what theater does, shows us different snapshots of a given, given situation or a given issue. And so my question to you would be, um, do you see it that way? I do. I see the piece of paper as, um, as a stage. Um, and, and I also try to reference the fact um, that it's also a piece of paper. And I think of it as an empty stage, and there is no scene. It's just the figures and the fig the relationships of the figures to one another describe the the, the kind of emotional scene or however. Do you know of other artists who are working in this direction? I know a few. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you.